Although there are numerous other parallels and blunders we could list, I'll just look at a few more concerning the Last Supper and the Gethsemane scene. One of the most interesting and moving scenes from the Gospel of Mark is that of Jesus praying in the Garden of Gethsemane. We see Jesus' anxiety, his trepidation about the upcoming events, his natural desire to avoid them, and the mindset of the faithful servant willing to follow through with God's plan. They came to a place named Gethsemane, and he said to his disciples, Sit here until I have prayed. And he took with him Peter and James and John, and began to be very distressed and troubled. And he said to them, My soul is deeply grieved to the point of death. Remain here and keep watch. Is it possible that the author of Mark remembered the story of Jonah and how Jonah was grieved and sought supplication by praying to God? But Jonas was very deeply grieved, and he was confounded, and he prayed to the Lord. And God said to Jonas, Art thou very much grieved for the gourd? And he said, I am very much grieved, even to death. Jonah and Jesus are both deeply troubled. They are both deeply grieved. They are both grieved to the point of death, which is a very unusual phrase, and they both pray to God for help. It's also interesting to know that the Septuagint, the Greek translation of the Old Testament, rendered Jonah 1.9 as deeply grieved, meaning very sorrowful. But all of the English translations, including the King James Version, render both verses 1 and 9 as anger. But it displeased Jonah exceedingly and he was very angry. Then God said to Jonah, Is it right for you to be angry about the plant? And he said, It is right for me to be angry, even to death. It is almost certain that Mark could not read the Hebrew text directly, so he had to rely on the Greek Septuagint, so that he associated its rendering of grief with a suffering servant motif when in fact, the Hebrew is more accurately rendered as anger. In the scene known as the Last Supper, Jesus makes a big deal of the cup he is holding. He passes it to all the disciples who drink from it, and then he declares, This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many. Then in the garden, Mark has Jesus asking God to remove from him the cup that he must drink from shortly. And he was saying, Abba, Father, all things are possible for you. Remove this cup from me. Yet not what I will, but what you will. Then Jesus finds his disciples sleeping and later they all deny him. But did Jesus really do and say these things? Or did the author of Mark find fodder for his story in the Old Testament? I keep my faith, even when I said, I am greatly afflicted. Doesn't this sound a lot like Jesus in the garden? Wanting to avoid death, but telling God he would keep his faith at any rate. I said in my consternation, or dismay, haste, panic, anxiety, men are all a vain hope. Doesn't this remind us that even while the anxious Jesus prayed in the garden, his own disciples would let him down not only during the garden scene, but all throughout Mark's tale. His disciples certainly were a vain hope. What shall I render to the Lord for all his bounty to me? I will lift up the cup of salvation. Amazing, what are the odds of the cup metaphor appearing in both passages that also have other conspicuous similarities? Could Mark have lifted this cup of salvation metaphor and placed it literally into the Last Supper scene and figuratively in the garden scene and call on the name of the Lord? Well, that's sure what Jesus did in the garden scene. I will pay my vows to the Lord in the presence of all his people. 
This likely was viewed as a reference to the public execution of Jesus, which followed shortly after the Last Supper and Gethsemane events. Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of His saints. It seems that Mark was able to find useful references for the Last Supper and the Garden of Gethsemane scenes from the Psalms as well as the very popular story of Jonah. Mark seems to have also drawn from the scene of Jonah asleep in the ship during a violent storm. When Jesus finds his disciples asleep in the garden, he chides Peter about being asleep when he should be praying and calling upon God. Then he came and found them sleeping and said to Peter, Simon, are you sleeping? Could you not watch one hour? Watch and pray. So the captain came to him and said to him, What do you mean, you sleeper? Arise, call out to your God. In these passages, we see Mark's fiction unfolding before our eyes. Mark has replaced the captain in Jonah with Jesus and Jonah with Peter. The parallels here are not only suspiciously similar, but they're sequential. The captain, or Jesus, comes and finds them asleep, wakes them with a question rather than a statement, and then commands them to pray. And we could continue this line of research for a very long time and find an Old Testament precedent for almost every event in the Gospels. But if Jesus was never on earth, then there were never any events to record. And it makes sense that the early Christians, as well as the Gospel authors, would then create the details by using the writings and stories they were familiar with and the ones that came to be seen as revealing God's Messiah, the Jewish Scriptures. The Jewish Scriptures suddenly became a book about Jesus. The Christian version of Pesher was suddenly in full bloom. If Isaiah 53 said that someone made his grave with the wicked and the rich, and that he was numbered with the transgressors, then surely it was speaking about Jesus who then was made to be crucified with criminals and buried in a rich man's tomb via the skillful pens of the gospel authors. If Psalms 28:18 has David speaking about himself, saying they divide my garments among them and for my clothing they cast lots, then surely that wasn't David talking about himself, but was a hidden prophecy about Jesus. If Psalms 22:16 says they pierced my hands and feet, and Zechariah 12.10 says, And they shall look upon me, whom they have pierced, then surely these are talking about an event hundreds of years to come. Jesus' is crucifixion, and not someone contemporary to the Old Testament authors. If no real Jesus was anywhere near first century Palestine, we can clearly understand why the Gospel authors had to draw their details about Jesus from the sources they did know and these included the Old Testament, the Septuagint in many cases, as well as Greek philosophy and epic poetry. Many of the parallels involve passages taken out of context, mistranslated passages, and passages that were not at all predictions of a coming Messiah. We might even say that early Christianity was the apex of misinterpretation. If you want to read a good book about the Old Testament precedents of Jesus' life, check out Randall Helms' Gospel Fictions. In the next video, we'll take a quick look at some passages in the Gospels that were inserted much later, more evidence that shows just how much these writings were embellished and edited. The historical reliability of the Gospels continues to decline as we expose them to the seemingly harsh but undeniably bright light of the facts. Until then, das vidanya.